Wow. Uh, what a great place. What a, what a great uh, group of people. Thank you all so much for, for the hospitality. I'm especially happy to know I'm not the only one stealing things from hotels. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I have quite a collection, and, and, and I'm willing to share it, uh, share it with anybody. You know, uh, probably next to family and friends, where you work and who you work with is probably the most important thing in our life. And, and you know, many people uh, say that they start a company so that they can create a place where they like to go to work. But it's true for all of us, whether you work for a company or you, you run a company, you have the power uh, to make it a better place uh, to work. And, and I want to talk a little bit about some stories about uh, uh, my career, if I can get this to move. Uh, let's see, maybe it's this one. I could just talk to, so. <laughs> I'll turn it on. Turn it on. It's a secret. <laughs> but it's like a television, you here, know? <laughs> here. Let, let, let's try okay. it. Okay. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You know, that, that's, of course, a problem, you know, if you're trying to watch Netflix is you do have to turn it on. Uh, <laughs> that's what our kids are for, you know. They, they, they will turn it on for us. But the... the um, one of the exciting thing about today's world is that it's changing so fast, and when we, when we think about going to work, we want to work in a place that is fun and enjoyable and especially rewarding. And so I want to tell a few stories about some of the great places where I've worked, uh, including Netflix, and, and the role that plays in, in, in being successful, but most importantly, um, dealing with the future. Now, uh, the world has changed. I mean, it, believe it or not, Netflix was founded 20 years ago. And we worked in obscurity. No one knew who we were for our first three years. And it was during those years, the difficult time where everybody, you know, would say there's no reason to have a business like Netflix that the true culture is built. But just imagine 20 years ago, uh, Amazon was only three years old, and the way they got customers was through the radio. The advertising for Amazon said, we have so many books, you, it would overflow the Queen Mary. Well, no one knew how big the Queen Mary was, but it sounded like a lot of books. And and 20 years ago, the internet was just beginning. Uh, we, we weren't having our cell phones uh, in our hands all the time. You actually got some peace uh, in the world. But the, a lot has changed. Uh, and especially, you know, the home entertainment business, which is kind of where I started. Uh, the, um, you probably remember Blockbuster and buying DVDs or buying VHS cassettes, but uh, in those days, the, the whole idea of, of entertainment was for everybody to be able to watch whatever they wanted uh, whenever, uh, on whatever device they could. The problem was the only device was your television in your house, and that kept you from watching it any place. And of course, look at us now, like, you know, we're watching episodes of Seinfeld or episodes of Stranger Things on our phone. Uh, while we're on our way to work. So the, the world has changed a lot. But a group of people got together. There was myself and two other people to, to try to solve one of the biggest problems that we thought, and that is people want to see lots of entertainment. They want to see a whole variety of things. And that's why we started Netflix. In fact, what we were really trying to do if you remember video stores where you had to bring movies back, people hated that. But did Blockbuster ever do anything about it? No. They thought, you know, we're making a lot of money by torturing people, making them return the movies, which they hate. 
And it's a symptom of big companies who don't listen to their customers and aren't close to the customers. This is the only reason why startups succeed, is that the big incumbent player misses what the customers really want. And what our vision was, was let's mail DVDs to people's homes. They can keep them for as long as they want. And in fact, this whole idea came, uh, you know, before we got to subscription, we were renting movies just like Blockbuster. And we wanted to be the Amazon of DVD. And we walked into our warehouse one day in San Jose, California. We saw millions of DVDs in very sophisticated shoe boxes, organized alphabetically. And Reed Hastings, the CEO, said, what are all these DVDs doing here? They should be in our customers' homes. And from that, we came up with subscription. But I remember the next day, we were so excited. Everybody went home to tell our wives and our children. And they said, are you kidding? Like, that is the stupidest idea I have ever seen in my life. We couldn't find a single friend who thought it was a good idea. The only way we survived is this was the dot-com boom period in 98 and 99. And you could walk into an investment company and say, I'm going to ship rocks to people's homes and I need a million dollars to start a company to do that. And in those days, you could walk out of that office with a million dollars. You're going to ship rocks. And of course, Amazon's doing that uh, today. So no one believed. And that, when you have, it, it's, almost, it's almost like you build culture for your company when no one believes you can uh, uh, do it. And in fact, that is the time that you pull together and you understand just how important teamwork is. <clears throat> the, um, uh, oops, here we go. Um, you know, Netflix is, as I said, started by shipping millions and millions of DVDs. Uh, wasn't very sophisticated. Um, we had lots of people filling envelopes. It never came to Spain because by the time we got to streaming, uh, that's when, inter when international expansion happened. But believe it or not, today, still today, there is $800 million, Netflix is still uh, uh, bringing in $800 million shipping DVDs uh, to people's homes. And it's still, still quite a business. One of the things, and, and this, this shows you how staying close to your customer is incredibly important and building a culture that continues to connect to your customer is so important. We were trying to be the Amazon of DVD. And one day, we had a focus group. And after the focus group was over, a young man walked out of the room. And we overheard him say, you know, when I rented the movie, I was in the mood for a comedy. And two days later, when it arrived in my home, I wanted a drama. That one, that one thing that young man said drove the entire future of Netflix. We learned at that time that getting the movie fast from the time you're thinking about it to the time you can watch it was the most important thing. And in fact, what's, what's faster than streaming? Streaming is the ultimate culmination of that. I wish I knew who that young man was because he was the true kind of guiding light uh, for the company. And it showed me how no matter what you do in a company, you have to figure out how to listen to what customers want, and especially uh, your younger customers. I actually uh, started using a, a process after that by when I would hire a brand new employee, especially someone who hadn't learned to be politically correct, because, you know, your first job, you're going you're gonna to say anything. You don't know to be quiet when your boss is around. Uh, I would bring in the youngest employee and ask them what we should be doing to make the product or the service better. 
And that's where I learn more than I would learn from my senior vice presidents, from my vice presidents. It's that, it's that young employee who's willing to tell you anything. And so we discovered speed was important, but at the time, we didn't know exactly how to do that. Remember, in 1998, there was no such thing as streaming. There was no such thing as downloading. And we didn't know, but we called the company Netflix because ultimately we knew the internet would, would be the way to go. But when we overheard this young man say, I need the movie quick from the time I decide, we came up with three clever ways to address it. One of them was a kiosk. We were going to put kiosks inside grocery stores so that you could get your movies when you go to the grocery store. Another one was this actually too complicated peer-to-peer -peer renting where we would send you an envelope and the return address wouldn't be our warehouse, it would be the next customer. Well, ultimately, the simplest idea was the one that succeeded, which was, let's just build mini warehouses all over the country. And that was the interim step uh, to streaming, which eventually came in between 2005 and 2008. Uh, it was really just an experiment. Uh, it was really only until after 2008 that it became popular. Uh, and what was fascinating about this whole thing is the big play, you know, we actually invited uh, the CEO of Blockbuster to come to our office one day. Uh, we were struggling because this was after the, the dot-com boom and, and we were running out of money. Uh, the stock market had gone down and we invited the whole executive team of Blockbuster that had a completely different culture. Uh, to visit us, and we were trying to get them to invest in Netflix. We showed them the warehouse. We showed them how clever we were in shipping these discs. And we said, we'd love to sell you half of the company for $50 million. And to show you the difference in the culture, their response was, we know more about this business than you do. Why would we buy half of your company? And if it's such a great idea, we'll just do it ourselves. When you, when you become the number one player in any field, the biggest danger is getting a mindset that no one can teach you anything. You know more than anybody else. And that is incredibly dangerous and more dangerous than it, than it um, uh, was then. Uh, had they bought half of the company, uh, the company is now worth $80 billion. It would have been a pretty, good in, in, a pretty good investment. And of course, you don't see Blockbuster around anymore. Not that I feel good about that. <laughs> uh, the, um, as I said, you've got, you know, a culture that stays close to your customer is the one that's going to win. If you, if you don't feel and understand what the customer wants, you will never get it. And if you can't do it, you've got to bring people into your organization uh, who do. One of the amazing things uh, that always surprises me is cable companies who've been, you know, sending movies through cable boxes to people for years and years make it so difficult to watch the next episode of a series. Uh, I don't know if it's true here, but in the US, if you are watching Comcast Cable or Time Warner, you get to the end of an episode and you have to back, forward, search, find, and play to watch the next episode in a series. By staying close, to the customers at Netflix, it's automatic. You know, in 15 seconds, it goes to the next episode. It seems like an incredibly obvious thing, but the, the cable companies all around the world have never figured, I think just recently, some of them have started to do it. Of course, now Netflix is, is uh, over 100 million subscribers, uh, 130 countries. The only country it's really not in is China. And it, I, I remember <clears throat> uh, Reed, uh, the CEO, celebrated uh, the first million subscribers by going to a, a little tiny diner and eating a steak dinner 
I saw a picture of him recently celebrating the hundred millionth uh, in the same in the exact same restaurant. But I remember my bet on what I believed would be the biggest we would ever get, and my bet was 1.7 million subscribers. Uh, so you can tell, tell I was I was incredibly wrong. Now. What really led to our success, because it wasn't all easy, it wasn't kind of uh, straightforward, were people, culture, and our clear objectives, which is really a system. Because as much as you can talk about, you know, building a great culture, you, you need these three ingredients. And let me tell you what I mean by them. The first one with people is you have to have a diverse group of people at the top. Uh, you know, I, I, I see all the issues with uh, sex scandals in Hollywood these days with the Weinstein Group and, you know, even Kevin Spacey at, at, uh, uh, at, at some of the product that Netflix releases. And it always reminds me that if we had a more diverse leadership, if we had more women leaders, those things would never happen because... You know, I know with my wife, for example, if I do something wrong, my wife doesn't let me get away with it. And, and, and I know if, if, if you have a company that has a diverse set of leaders, not, not the VPs, I mean at the top, you will not have these types of things happen. But that's, that's the kind of thing you need to do. And most important of all, people want to go to work with people they like and they respect and they enjoy. And the one thing I found is, you've, we, we used to have this thing, the no asshole rule. And I don't know how that translates. I think you were talking to Kulo, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so no one likes to work with somebody who is a jerk and un, it's not fun to be around. So you, it's like a bad apple kind of makes everything you know bad. So you have to, Get rid of people quick. You know, I don't think you've, I've ever, uh, whenever I've postponed making a decision that I knew someone was kind of making everybody uncomfortable, I would always delay it. You know, oh, maybe they'll get better, maybe we'll solve it, maybe they'll just quit. But I, every time I regretted that. You have, when you find people, even if they're the most valuable software engineer, which is, a very common area for people who aren't fun to be around. Uh, <laughs> you you have to get rid of them quick. You have to you know move them out because you can't have a great culture or a great work environment with people who aren't fun or are mean or you know have other kinds of problems. That's an important one. <clears throat> culture is important because because you know leaders have to exemplify respect. And you know what I found? You know I wasn't always a good manager of people. Uh, I thought that I needed to treat everybody the same way. I thought, to be fair, I would have to treat each individual exactly the same. And eventually, I I brought in a coach who was really more a psychologist. He would sit me down and ask me how I felt, and he would say, you know what? To be honest and fair with people you have to treat them the way they want to be treated and understand what is important and valuable to them. That means you have to know enough and care enough about the individuals who report to you to treat them the way they want to be treated. What's important to them? Is it respect? Is it more money? Is it more time off? You have to understand what they want and if you do that, they will produce and be that much better. But it's respecting what each individual wants and, and as much as you can, give them what they want. And you have to, you know, Netflix was not an easy environment. It was very competitive. Uh, you know, we didn't follow, you know, I don't know if you know the, uh, the Jack Welch uh, GE rule where every year he fires the bottom 10% of him, his employees. Netflix wasn't like that, but it was so competitive. If you, if you could make mistakes, uh, you could make one mistake. You couldn't make two. If you made two, 
it, you obviously didn't care enough to learn uh, to not make it again. And what was even more important is the transparency. Uh, uh, we, we developed uh, goals that everybody knew about. Everybody knew what everybody's goals were. And they were rewarded uh, for doing well and safe when they made a mistake, but again, not twice. So it's, it's creating a competitive environment and rewarding big. And, <clears throat> and making clear objectives. The worst thing in creating a culture is when you don't know how you're going to be rewarded. Uh, you know, Jeff Bezos sa uh, from Amazon says that communication is a failure of everybody knowing what they should do. If you have to, I don't know, I mean, how many people love having lots and lots of meetings? Like, is anybody going to raise their hand? Does everybody love meetings? Uh, yeah, no. Meetings are, you have meetings because many times people don't know what's expected of them. And if you, if you have a culture that lays out exactly what you're responsible for and what your authority is, you don't need as many meetings because everybody knows what they're supposed to do. Everybody has a clear understanding and it's not subjective. You cannot have an organization where people get rewarded because they're nice or you like them or, you know, they are like you. Um, you know, a lot of people say that uh, the U.S. wouldn't have gone to war in Iraq had George Bush had more diverse people within his leadership. They were all former Yale graduates and, and not a diverse group of people. So you, you have to have this transparency, this way to measure performance uh, that is clear and uh, not, subjecti not, sub not uh, subjective to people's own uh, beliefs. Oops. Uh, another company which really surprised, so I left uh, Netflix and got recruited by McDonald's uh, of all places. I mean, I'm, you know, I generally eat well. I never would have eaten at, at McDonald's. Uh, they called me the McDonald's avoider and, and, uh, and, and then put my cube uh, right next to the test, the test kitchen, which by the way, what they make in the test kitchen is never in the restaurant. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot better. But McDonald's was a company that you would think wouldn't be the best culture in dealing with change and adversity. But in 2002, uh, McDonald's had a very challenging time. They found that their sales were, were dropping, and they were looking for all kinds of ways to reverse that. Uh, I don't know if you know, but McDonald's bought Chipotle restaurants back in those days and really started building it. And they had this other idea, and this is why they recruited me, to rent movies in front of a McDonald's restaurant. The idea was, is back to the Blockbuster model, you had to return the DVD, you would smell the burgers and fries, and it would create an incremental transaction. And it actually worked. It actually worked. There's still 3,000 uh, DVD vending machines at McDonald's in the U.S. of the 13,000. But what was happening? But what? But McDonald's couldn't figure out is why suddenly their business started declining. And besides investing in Chipotle and putting in DVD machines, they did all kinds of other things. They did what they called the healthy choices menu. I don't know if it got to Spain, but the idea was uh, apple walnut salads and other types of healthy food. Of course, no one bought them, you know. The burgers were too, smelled too good and the fries were good. So they struggled trying to figure it out. But meanwhile, we started this business called Redbox and, uh, and I tried to bring the same kind of culture that I learned at Netflix over to Redbox. And it was funny because we were within this bigger organization of McDonald's. One of the things I learned at the time, which has been a, a huge um, uh, benefit, is using the Net Promoter Score. And I'm sure you've seen this survey where they ask you, on a scale of 0 to 10, how likely 
would you recommend my product to a friend? And that's very common. But what I found is asking a second question is actually the most important. And you can use this in measuring you know, your product, the loyalty of your product. You can even use it internally for management skills of your team. But at Redbox, I asked the question of, what's the most important thing we can do to improve our product? And there was really three answers. People said, more copies of the hit movies. Uh, I'm tired of getting a scratch DVD. Or make the lines faster at the kiosk. And by segmenting, by segmenting the answers and, and attacking the one that the passively satisfied people, you know, you could, you could say, I'm going to, to try to improve the results of the people who don't like my service, what we call the detractors. And you can see the thing that they, you know, really wanted was to have um, less scratch discs. Or I could go after the ones who love the business, try to make it better. They wanted more copies. But the people who rated us seven and eight, who were in this passively satisfied group, they wanted faster lines. And so by approaching and fixing that problem and establishing that as goals for much of my team, we actually drove the business uh, dramatically up. But in order to solve that, we had to come up with some clever ideas. This kind of reminds me of, of what we were doing at Netflix when we heard that young man say faster. In this scenario, we tried everything from, you know, speeding up the robotics in the machine. You know, we, we tried to see if we could hire dwarfs to go in, I'm kidding, uh, in, in the machines. But by, a pro, by attacking the problem that the people who almost loved us but didn't quite, that was what accelerated our business, not trying to go after the people who already love us or, or who don't like us at all. And as a result, the business grew like crazy. We ended up opening uh, one kiosk every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years in a row. And we grew that business from a couple million dollars uh, to eight, uh, one and a half billion dollars in revenue uh, over an eight-year period. And it's in periods like that that culture becomes incredibly important, especially when, if you're in, in a high-growth uh, company, the hardest thing is maintaining that culture while you're adding people, because how do you know they're going to be the same quality of the people you hired. And, and I, I was talking about this earlier today. Uh, we, in, we tested all kinds of hiring uh, systems, and there's lots of very interesting ones. We used one uh, which, was the, um, which, was, which was everybody has to love this new employee model. And I'll tell you about it some other time. But uh, there's lots of ways uh, to get into problems when you're hiring lots of people just as much as when you're small and, and you can uh, deal with people one at a time. Uh, believe it or not, Redbox still does $2 billion in revenue. You know, you would think DVD is dead, right? DVD is still a big business in the U.S. They still do $2 billion a year. So by the way, the McDonald's problem. So remember, they had gone down in business, and what, the pro what they finally discovered, what the problem was, and this took two years to figure out, is in the night, you know, through the whole history of McDonald's, the Happy Meal bringing in mothers of young children was how they built their business. Well, in the 90s, they started getting young adult males, college kids who wanted a good meal for $5. And what do young adult males do when they go into the bathroom? It's not very clean after they leave. And the mothers of young children got tired of bringing their children to a restaurant with dirty bathrooms. So it turned out after buying Chipotle, investing in Redbox, all these other th the healthy choices menu, it turned out the only thing they needed to do was clean the bathrooms. They started cleaning the bathrooms, and the business came back. 
Their stock went from $14 to $90. And it's had, had the executives gone out and just seen what was happening, this would have, they would have saved hundreds of millions of dollars and, and solved the problem, you know, way early. And this is like so critical to stay close uh, to your customers. And of course, I probably was partially responsible for that. Um, so again, you know, industry leaders respond differently. You don't want to be leading or a part of a company that doesn't respond and understand your customer. Again, same things, you know, people, culture, systems, you know, those three, uh, those, if, you can, if you can put those three into place, uh, you, it, you reduce the risk of, of failure. Uh, a lot of people, you know, in the business world hide their head in the sand. I'm sure you know businesses like this and say, you know, maybe it'll just go away. Maybe the competition uh, will fail or maybe we don't need to do anything. And of course, you know, what ends up happening is things like this. You know, none of these, you know, I wish this one, Trump International, was truly gone. Uh, <laughs> it's actually embarrassing being an American these days. Uh, but that part of his empire did fail. And none of these companies are around except for AMC. And I'm hoping in the next few years they may have some problems. Um, only because I'm competing against them. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I'm not mean, but about, uh, eight, or about 22 years ago, uh, I owned video stores. And I had a beautiful store in Tiburon, California, a beautiful little town north of San Francisco. And uh, one day, a blockbuster opened up across the street. And the next day, they hired all my employees. And the next day, I vowed to destroy them. And, <laughs> and I ended up putting them in a pincer movement with Redbox on one side and Netflix on the other. And I think my last... Uh, my last month uh, as president of Redbox, I bought all the assets of, of Blockbuster and I put them in a giant warehouse in Cincinnati. And it's, they're still there. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's not nice to do that. But yeah, they were mean to me, so. But you don't want to be one of these companies. And especially today, uh, this is an interesting chart. You know, last year, one company every single week was founded that is worth, now worth over a billion dollars. And the difference from 20 years ago to today is you can start a business on an idea. You don't need huge amounts of employees. You don't need, you know, big offices with service, servers and you don't need a big legal team and accounting. You can outsource everything. You know, it uh, was just a while back that two guys were sitting in their apartment in San Francisco. It was a one-room apartment, a, a studio, and they couldn't pay the rent. And they were thinking, geez, how do we, how do, you know, we can't rent a room out because there's just this one room. So they thought, you know, let's go to Walmart, let's buy some blow-up air mattresses, and we'll rent them out for $10 a night. You know, today, that's Airbnb. Travis Galinick, you know, a few years after that, was in Paris, and he and his partner were thinking, God, wouldn't it be cool if we could just pull out our phone and a car would show up? And now that's Uber. And you look at these companies, and it's just every single one of these is just based on an idea, and an idea that should have been developed by the leaders in the industry. Blockbuster should have developed Netflix. AMC should have developed MoviePass, the company I have now. Hertz should have come up with Uber. All these ideas are because those companies spent more time protecting their, their business than reaching out to the customer and seeing what they wanted. And now that it's so easy to start a business, there it's even more dangerous uh, than it was before. But if you, by the way, WeWork, you know, WeWork is about to announce a new business called We Live. 
And you'll start to see them all over the world. If you go into a WeWork, you see this incredible kind of environment, this culture where everybody's, you know, young and, and exploring business and having a good time. So now they're going to open these where everybody's living there as well. And so it, these ideas are, are just coming up like crazy uh, and changing the whole, whole world. One of the things that excites me the most is what companies are doing to reduce the friction of transactions. By, by every time, you know, it's pretty logical. If you buy something on the internet, every time the internet asks you for information, people drop out. Well, the same thing is true at retail. When you walk into a store, every time you have to do something uh, prior to buying, either finding the product, picking the product, walking to the cash register, paying for it, all of those reduce purchases. But it's also true for every business. Every single transaction that you are involved in uh, creates dropout and creates fewer uh, transactions and, and a less satisfactory experience. Amazon has these new stores where you walk into the store, you pick things off the shelf, put them in a basket, you walk out, you put them in a bag, and you walk out, and you never talk to any, you, you know, you, anybody you talk to is just giving you information. And you've probably seen this in hotels. Why should you have to go to the front desk? Now you can pull up the key on your phone and go straight to your room. In your business, anytime you can reduce the friction of a transaction, you are improving your business. And, and these ideas come from your employees who are close to the customer. Either you have to be or, or your team has to be. And so making sure you have a culture that is connected to your customer, no matter what business you're in, is probably the most important uh, aspect of, of success. And so in any of these things, you know, the worst thing is just saying, oh, I can't decide yet, I've got to go slow. You have to be brave and you have to move forward and make uh, decisions. And especially in regards to your culture, don't be afraid if you're part of a larger organization to make it better, to, to work hard to make it the kind of place where you want to go to work. Get rid of the assholes and make it a fun place uh, to be. And I'd be happy to answer questions, or, or, no, or are we moving on? Yeah? OK. First. Okay. Ah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless me, girl. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Y bienvenidos. Gracias por venir. Um, I can't believe you have kept po uh, politically correct during your career. <laughs> you have to explain me that. Uh, I have, well, uh, that I have been politically yes. correct? <laughs> uh, uh, I haven't always been, <laughs> been politically correct, uh, but I've learned. That was a politically correct answer. Ah, okay. <laughs> I've learned, I, have, I had a good coach. <laughs> we're talking, we're talking uh, today I about... Uh, films. Oops. Sorry. Creating um, winning cultures. Uh, we had uh, we had had like a very uh, interesting uh, chat uh, while having uh, lunch today, and at some point uh, you mentioned a triple orientation policy: customers, investors, and employees. Yeah. But uh, what goes first? Yeah, yeah. It's a it's a really um, it's a question that companies actually don't answer uh, often. They th they. You know, the, if you have these three constituencies of employees, customers, and investors, of many people, if, if, you were, if you have a decision like, you know, my investors need more return on their money, uh, and they are the most important, you might cut employee benefits, or you might raise the cost of the product. But the companies that succeed for the longest period of time are the companies like Starbucks, uh, like Netflix, that say our employees are the most important. Employees always win, 
And if, if my employees love working for the company, they're going to create the best products, give the best service, and therefore the customers will love us, and as a result, the investors will love us. The other way is, is kind of the opposite. If I keep rewarding my investors, I'll keep getting more money coming in so I can pay my employees. You know, so mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, Richard Branson believes this. Uh, it's, it's just a different way of thinking, but many times people don't even ask the question. You've, you, you, you've got to at least ask and answer that question in your company. It comes a, a, a key question too here. Uh, if, if customers are, or if, if employees are so important, how important as well are salaries in, 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 in creating uh, an exceptional working environment? Yeah, salaries are one of the kind of, le not, not the least important, but they are definitely less important than other things. The, um, you know, you need a fair salary, but you don't necessarily need to be over, be overpay people. What you need is you need to reward people for doing great work. But for the, like I said, the things they want, maybe they want more time off. You know, at, at Netflix, we launched uh, unlimited vacation. And so you could take as much vacation as you want. You could, in fact, you could come to work one day a year y if you wanted to. And, cool. and, and however, remember what I said, you also had uh, very, very clear objectives. You, let's say you had to improve uh, the, the uh, profitability of your subscribers by 1%. If you could go to Tahiti and that happened, then you could keep your job. But if, if you took a vacation and you didn't hit your goal, then you couldn't. So, so what we learned is people really wanted the freedom to decide how to get their job done. Uh, so, but, it, but not everybody. Some people wanted a very clear you know, be at work from nine to five. So it's more, about, it's more about learning what's important to the individuals and then customizing, you know, sometimes it's salary, sometimes it's bonus, vacation time, uh, education uh, support, those types of things. But if, if we convey this to a, a new, like a high pressure a startup, uh, mm -hmm. Which would be the, the rest of the ingredients of this recipe? I mean, how do you manage or how do you deal to, to, to create this exceptional value? I mean, you start at the beginning is like a very difficult uh, working environment. Yeah, yeah. They, they definitely say, um, you know, that if you want to work 80 hours a week, you should go work at a startup. Uh, because, because you do, you know, like I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a deal right now and my phone is telling me I'm supposed to sign something. You know, it's like non It's Working at a startup is like nonstop. Uh, but it's, if you aren't, if, if, if you are not comfortable with ambiguity in your job, because in startups, you're doing probably four jobs. You're probably, you know, doing, you know, things that you aren't great at, but there's no one else to do them. So in a startup, it's, you have to be prepared to do any and everything all the time until you get, you know, you start building out the teams. Uh, during our lunch, you mentioned too uh, your experience in dealing with situations in which you had to hire a lot of people, yeah. like in a short uh, period of time. We're not talking about like big companies and, and hiring uh, a lot of people now, but uh, there is something very, very interesting in, 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 in the way you did it. Can, can you please tell us how, how, how you managed to do that? Yeah, what we, what we did is we, um, we did this process uh, called unanimous hiring. And what we found is when you're adding lots of people, the, your existing team starts to feel alienated towards all these new people. Whenever you have a new person come in, they, they don't feel comfortable. Uh, they feel new and like the new kid at school. And the existing employees, you know, wonder who this is. So we instituted a thing where every new employee had to be interviewed by 12 people from every, you know, from receptionist, warehouse, you know, the head of marketing, operations, and so on. And everybody unanimously 
had to agree that this new candidate should be hired. Any one person could veto a hire. And what that did is it made everybody feel that they were, they were responsible for maintaining the culture in the company. And on the, at the same time, the new hires felt like, okay, I've been accepted. There's no question, you know, that someone didn't accept me. Everybody has accepted me. So it really, you know, the human resource teams hate those ideas, but it really <laughs> does. Anybody in HR? Uh, uh, and, and mostly because it feels like very, like it will slow down the process, mm -hmm. but it really does work. We'll try to, we'll try to, to implement it. Um, oh, we have some questions here. Ah, okay. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, recordad que eh, podéis hacer preguntas con las tarjetitas que os hemos dejado eh, encima de las eh, sillas, creo que están. Podéis eh, enviar eh, vuestras preguntas, creo que por aquí o por allí al fondo había alguna. No, por ahí no. So in the meantime, oh, we have a question from um, Carlos, Carlos Puig. From Tenerife. <laughs> no, he's not the guy from Tenerife. <laughs> How do you assess, um, we're talking actually about that, uh, how do you assess if a person actually fits into your company culture? The, um, well, a lot of times, you know, when you do these uh, 12 interviews, someone will, see, someone will see something that the other people will not see. So the first thing, the first thing that I do is I try to see if that individual treats other people with respect. And oftentimes, you know, the, and I, I copied this from Warren Buffett, uh, who is brilliant at this. Uh, what he does is he takes people to a, uh, a restaurant, and, and it's not an expensive restaurant. He tries to take them, not to McDonald's, but something, you know, in that kind of category. And he watches how, how a candidate treats the people bringing the food to the table. And because many people will treat the boss or their peers with respect, but they may not show respect to the people who are serving food or, or driving the car. And so he looks to see that. And I use that method because to me, it's if people don't treat everybody with respect, I don't want to work with them. And, and so that's the first one. The second one is, um, are they really passionate? Is this just a job, or are they really passionate about their, their work? I don't mean they should, like, drop family and friends, but do, are they really kind of passionate? So those two things, you know, treating other people with respect, um, not, just pe not just people who, who are maybe higher paid than them, but everybody, uh, and being passionate about the job. Companies change. Have you ever felt that yourself was not fitting in the company culture anymore? Oh, yeah. Well, that's why I left Netflix, and that's why I left Redbox, is that I w I've always loved the kind of the early stages of business, and the reason I love it is because you can be, you know, there's not a lot of rules. You can break rules, and you can, uh, you don't have to be constrained by uh, what your lawyers tell you you have to do. Uh, so at Netflix, after we went public, uh, it got to be too bureaucratic. And uh, I think not only I, but I think everybody felt like this guy is going to cause us trouble. He better get, <laughs> better get out of there. So yeah, that happens to me on a regular basis. So at the end, what did you learn from, from Netflix? I learned um, the importance of culture. I learned that you, that, that, Uh, this whole world, especially the business world, is changing so fast that if you don't, if you don't constantly educate yourself and stay close to new technology, that it'll go right by you. Um, so, you know, lots of things, but those would, would be two things. So we have a question from Carol. Um, do we really need to reduce transactional processes in hotels if hospitality... <laughs> Is the core of the business? Uh, It's a tricky <laughs> question. <laughs> um, 
Is this a, a towel theft question, or <laughs> <laughs> it's that bathrobe that I didn't return? <laughs> it's a good question, actually. <laughs> now, say the question one more time, please. Do we really need to reduce transactional processes in hotels ah. if hospitality is the core of business? Yes, yes, absolutely. The the if if the if the interaction currently is one that the customer would prefer not to do, I mean, who likes coming into a hotel and there being a line of people checking in? Yes, if, 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 the, if the idea was you could walk in and immediately be greeted by someone who told you all about the benefits of the hotel and where everything was, uh, that would be great. But if you have to wait in line, that's, that's where it's bad. And, and so reduce, you know, reducing lines is an important ingredient in any, any kind of business. We have another question from Mercedes. How do you deal with the fact that uh, a consumer doesn't really know what he wants or changes his mind frequently? <clears throat> yeah, that's uh, it, especially in the world of entertainment where there's so many choices. Actually, the, we found that, that when you go above 60 options um, as the maximum, you reduce consumption. And so, uh, and seven is really the magic number. You know, the reason, you know, there was a lot of science done in how many numbers can you conveniently remember in your head, and seven is the kind of the norm. So anytime you go above seven options, uh, people kind of don't know what to do. At the same time, no one likes to be told what they want to, to like. And so it's a kind of a balance where you need kind of science to present people with things they're likely to enjoy and not overwhelm them. Uh, so it's really, it's a balance act of, you know, give choice, but not too much. So related to this, I had another question that it was like, uh, at the end, which do you think is the reason uh, of the success of the brand of Netflix in this case? It's... Um, it's mostly around giving people freedom, giving people the, the freedom to watch content wherever they are, uh, you know, in a, in a super affordable, low-priced uh, way. Uh, you know, they say that the cost of delivering an hour of content uh, over these last 10 years has dropped 85%, uh, at least in the U.S. And so by giving people um, a lower and lower cost of consuming and, fl and even greater flexibility at the same time uh, allowed Netflix to, to flourish and, and being the first one out uh, made it kind of the number one. Are we witnessing the end of uh, TV? I think we're, um, we're definitely seeing more TV watched outside the, tel outside the living room outside the bedroom, more on your, on your phone. The phone is becoming the TV of the future, which changes the way content is made. Now the content, you know, big special effects are no longer all that important. Now it's story and characters and building kind of a long relationship uh, with that content. So at the end, uh, that's a question, of, of course, that uh, you'd like for us today. Uh, Give us advice uh, for all the alumni of EAE uh, that are, are interested in starting uh, a new project, a startup. Well, it's, it's uh, you've, I guess, a couple things. You know, the, the, the danger of starting a new business is running out of money. You know, <laughs> money, money, that's why my phone is ringing. Um, money is the most difficult thing. And, and most ideas take two or three years you know, at Netflix, you know, when we started, we really had no clue. Uh, you know, we, we, but money was easy. And so we thought, well, give us a couple years and we'll figure it out. And, but today you don't have that benefit or that luxury. So uh, building a, a couple people, you know, they say that um, a company, a startup with two founders, co you know, that support each other is, has a higher likelihood of success, so you know, get a partner, build a couple people around you, get a great idea, 
and then, boy, try to raise money. It's, it's you know, try, to, try to get a lot more money than you think you need because you always, there's always something that goes wrong. I have another question from Adriana. Adriana, Adriana she pointed that she's from Cantabria. Oh, I'll okay. Let you know. <laughs> Where is Which that? Cantabria, it's northern Spain. Oh, okay. Um, which is your, your favorite uh, Spanish company and the reason why? Uh, well, I love, I love Zara. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it's always a place I can buy something for my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason why? Yes, and the reason why? The reason why. It's, it's a, actually a really easy place to shop. You know, it's easy, you know, it's spread out. I'm not a great shopper, but, you know, I get most everything online. And, um, you know, even groceries and everything like that. But my daughter needs me to go with her. And so <laughs> that's, uh, that's why I like it. It's, it's a fun place to go. And Pablo uh, would like to ask, which has been uh, the biggest mistake in your career? And, and what have you learned from it? Well, um, there, it's been two, is I have... Um, I've worked with people who I was naive to believe that they were good people. And so I've had some experiences with people who uh, just were in it for the money. And, and, and not, you know, you have to believe in the product and the people you work with. And if, you're, if you go into a business and all you want to do is make money, you do things that are not right for, the, for either the customers or the employees. So the big, biggest mistake I ever did was I was working with someone who all they wanted to do was make a million dollars. And that made them do things that were not right. Another tricky question here from uh, Orlando Rodriguez. How many time uh, did it take for you to earn money in your first company, in your first project? The, uh, well, the first one was video stores, and uh, I borrowed money from my mother. Uh, it, they're always good for a few dollars. <laughs> and and um, I think it took 12 years to pay her back. Uh, she was more patient than banks <laughs> are today. At which rate? Huh? At which rate? At, uh, you know, <laughs> there was no interest rate. Okay. And it still took me a long time to pay her. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we don't have uh, more time. Okay. Thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you very much for your questions. Thank you.